Well, we'll try to get back to the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Reminding ourselves that in the study of John, we're studying a book that's primarily apologetic in nature. And again, I want to say, because of our modern usage of the word apology, we mean, well, I've done wrong and I'm sorry for it. That's not at all what we're talking about when we talk about apologetics. We're talking about making defense of those things we believe most surely to be true regarding God and Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Bible, and all things pertaining thereto. Some people have the idea that, well, if it's the truth, you don't need to defend it. I don't know whether they ever learned that. The truth came in the world, the very form of Jesus Christ, because he is truth. And he spent a good part of his time defending it. And so we need not be fed that uh, bit of false idea by Satan to say, well, it's the truth. You can't knock it down. Well, ultimately, in the end of all things, it'll stand forth and shine clear. But right now, we're in the battleground. I wish some people understood that about living in this life in the Lord's army, the church, that we're in a battleground. First of all, individually, we have to battle Satan and his desire to destroy us by getting us to sin and live in sin and not get forgiveness of sin. And then, of course, there's always that need to, among the brethren who are faithful to encourage them prepare themselves to better defend faith so we can do what is enjoined upon us when Jude said, contend for faith. Once delivered to the saints, or as the American Standard 1901 says, once for all delivered to the saints. And there the faith men means the whole New Testament system of salvation. Word faith is used there, and the grammarians call it a synecdoche where part stands for the whole or whole for the part. Faith is such an integral part of the New Testament system, their inspiration pulls out the word faith and lets it stand for any component part of the New Testament's teaching or the whole thing. And so we are expected, we who have been made Christians by that faith and our belief and obedience to it, to contend for it, to stand up for it, we're the mouth of our Lord while we're on this earth as members of his spiritual body. We are his hands and we are his feet. And his work is done as his Christians do it. The gospel is committed to the church. And the gospel won't be preached to people unless each member of the church does what they can do to enable themselves to teach it in their various capacities. Now, remember, God would have everybody be saved. He's letting time continue, Peter tells us, so people can have a chance to come to repentance. But now they can't come to repentance if they don't know they're sinners and lost and undone, and that part of forgiveness of sins is repenting of those sins. And so how are they going to do that except that we teach them? The Lord would have every person be saved. But into our hands, the gospel is given. So we come to chapter 3, and now we see that John has selected another witness to come out here, and he's interested in saying, now Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. You can know it because you can prove it. And we're to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. First Thessalonians 5, 21. Uh, John's doing part of that right here as an apostle of Christ. So he introduces to us a fellow by the name of Nicodemus. I'm not going to read verbatim from the chapter, but I will hit the high points. Hopefully you'll be reading these things. Now, when you go back to that time, you know that there were certain sects of the Jews, Pharisees, Sadducees, are the ones we know the most of. There were those called the Essenes, and there were even others, but the ones most written of that we're familiar with are the Pharisees and Sadducees. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the Jews. 
a member of the Great Jewish Council, the Sanhedrin. And we find uh, him coming to Jesus. Now, that's interesting. What drew him to Jesus? Why would he come to Jesus? What would make him want to do that? Man has to be quite a busy man. But he took the time to come to Jesus. Came to the right person, didn't he? He used his time wisely, didn't he? We would do well to realize that today to benefit from Jesus, we have to come to him, which means we have to take the time and see the need to do that. But he did. He came to Jesus. And then the interesting idea is that he came to Jesus by night. Have you ever wondered why that's in the scriptures? Why? Now, if you're expecting me to give you the answer or any other mortal on this earth, then you can just keep expecting. We're never going to get the answer. It's just a fact. As to why he came to Jesus by night, no one under the sun knows. No one's ever known. Just the fact of the matter that he came to Jesus by night. You can speculate all day long. Well, he was scared of the Jews. He didn't have time during the day or whatever. You don't know that. That's assumption. Here's what you do know. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. I think sometimes we get all balled up and worried about why did Jesus come or why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? Well, we ought to be concentrating on the fact that he did determine in his own mind for obvious good reasons to seek out and find Jesus. There's where the emphasis ought to be given. I don't care whether he came at breakfast time, noon time, in the afternoon, or when he got up from a nap or whatever it was. He came to Jesus. Obviously, he had respect for the Lord to some extent. Great respect, far more than many people have today. He said plainly, we know that you're a teacher. Well, there's a lot of teachers then as there are now. But notice what he said. Here's the, here's the punch. We know that the art of teacher come from God. Now, there's a lot of folks who think they hear teachers that came from God. You ever ask yourself, how do I know whether a teacher's come from God or not? Well, there has to be some way he said, I know. And he said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Well, he tells us, doesn't he? Notice he cites evidence. How do you know, Nicodemus? For no one can do these signs, S-I-G-N-S, that thou doest, except God be with him. You know, if we get a lot of folks just this point in their approach to God in Christ, we would have led them a long way. But here's another one. You can't do anything with anybody until they at least reach this stage. There are a whole host of folks we'd like to see baptized into Christ tonight. Do all we could is right to get them obedient to the gospel. But until they, first of all, reach the stage that Nicodemus did right here, now that's a lost call. You can plead with people and beg people and love them more than they love themselves and put your arms around them and write them letters and encourage them every day. But until they reach the state of mind and that Nicodemus did, all those things just fall on deaf ears. The best they can do is try to get them to where they'll be like Nicodemus. For no one can do these signs. Thou doest, except God be with you. Now, that tells me the miracles, as we said earlier in this study, were not just simply astounding things, though they were, but they were signs. Signs. That tells us something about the design and purpose of the miracles that Jesus did. They were signs. They pointed to his deity. They pointed to him as God's messenger that his message was from heaven. For no man can do these things that thou doest except 
God be with him. Now, the an exceptional call mean, means this, if and only if God is with him. That's what, when you see accept, that's what you're saying. If and only if God be with him, could he do these things that are signs that prove he is who he claims to be? Now, he only went so far with this because he knew of the prophets of the Old Testament. They all had signs from God that they were God's spokesman. He hadn't gone any further than that, but he did know that God had sent this man. And I think he had a question in his mind because the scripture says Jesus answered, answered. Well, you answer questions, don't you? The Lord talked with Nicodemus, and as was the case in many times with the Lord, he is speaking of something immediately with Nicodemus that the man had no idea about. Remember, the Jews thought they were acceptable to God because they were descendants of Abraham through Jacob and his children. That's all that mattered. They were born in that way. Then that's, that's all they needed to have. But Jesus shakes the old man to the core. He talks about a new birth, which it's obvious he don't have, have any idea whatsoever he's talking about. Because all he could think of was a physical birth of a baby born of its mother. And he said, well, how, how can a man when he's old enter, uh, uh, be born again? Must he enter, Can he enter again the second time his mother's womb be born? Well, of course, that's really ridiculous. But that's the way the man thought. He didn't know any different. You know, a lot of times when we're trying to teach people, they can be pretty profound in some of the things that they conclude, such as we've noticed, for no man can be with you except God. No man can do these signs except God be with you. But yet he turns around and says, of a new birth, he says something, well, that's ridiculous to think of a grown person being born physically once again. So he, he rebukes Nicodemus a little bit. I don't think we could call it a harsh rebuke, but nevertheless, he rebukes him. The Lord never really answered the question in the mind of Nicodemus. Well, that's interesting to study about that. There's some things the Lord did when he taught on this earth and his earthly ministry that never would be understood till after his resurrection ascension and the church was established and things began to be revealed by the apostles who were baptized in the Holy Spirit and enabled thereby to know and understand things. Early church knew that because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. But nevertheless, he makes it clear that in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born of water and the Spirit. Born of water and the Spirit. Now hold that just for a moment and think about the Great Commission, that is Mark's inspired account of our Lord's Great Commission, of go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be down. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Now the gospel is God's power to save us from our sins, Romans 1, 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. The fundamentals of it are set out plainly. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's what people had to understand the very basics of it, to become a Christian. Well, what is it to be born of water and the Spirit? To obey Christ in doing what he said, do it the way he said, do it for the reason he said, do it, to gain remission of sins. So I think you can take Mark 16, 15, 16, parallel it alongside John 3, 3 and 5. And to be born of the Spirit is to be baptized into Christ for the mystery of sins. Now, somebody might want to get all beside themselves, start talking about 
things on God's side of the fence, which we can't see and can't understand, and we don't know. But that's not where the problem is, is it? The problem is on our side of the fence and keeping us from learning, understanding, and doing what our responsibility is. We often talk about, well, sin's against God. Sin's a transgression of the law. We transgress God's law. We sin against God. We're separated from God. There's no hope for us. We went over all of that. But here's the point. Whatever may go on on deity's side of the fence, when we from the heart obey that form of doctrine, the form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4, God's going to do his part. Remember, God forgives us of our sins. In his mind, he does not hold those sins against us anymore. We are not separated from him any longer. Our sins have been blotted out. They've been washed away in the blood of the Lamb. When? When from the heart we obeyed that form of doctrine. Well, that's what Jesus is talking about, being born of water and the Spirit. And so the Spirit has revealed in his word the gospel plan of salvation, that when men humbly understand it and believe it and obey it, then they're born of water and the Spirit into the kingdom of God. Now, whatever else you may want to try to figure out that God does or doesn't do, it's a whole lot like talking about providence. Well, God controls all things, but I can't necessarily see how he does all of that. And furthermore, I, I'm glad I don't have to know all of that. Now, Ken just finished up study of Esther's, one of the primary books of the Bible to teach about providence. Not a miracle mentioned in it. God's not even mentioned in it. And yet he permeates every word of it. And his care for his people is there. But you notice what is pointed out in that? Regardless of God's care and his doing what he does that only he can do, there was something for Esther to do. She had to do it. And there's where our concentration ought to be. And now here's the wonderful part. When we do our part, God takes all care of all the rest. And when we obey the gospel of Christ, and do what he said and the way he said it for the reason he said it, we're obedient, I think God will do his part. If I don't have that kind of faith based upon the totality of the teaching of the Bible on these matters, I don't know what good uh, study of the Bible is or why we're here tonight. Or we even have a Bible in our house. He purport to study. So it's obvious we take God at his word. You know, that's the most simple definition of faith in God is taking him at his word and he'll take care of everything else. Now, going further with uh, chapter three, we also have the testimony of Jesus. Uh, further, as we carry on out with, with this matter, Jesus uh, said, we speak that which we know. That's always been an interesting way of putting it. We speak that which we know. Well, have you ever tried to speak what you don't know? <laughs> that seems rather, rather ridiculous. I've seen some people try to speak as if they did know when the more they spoke, the more they proved they didn't. But they weren't about to say, I don't know. A lot of folks find it very hard to say, I don't know. You'd have to ask somebody else. You'd have to go somewhere else for your information. But one of the best things we can learn to say is when we're ignorant about something, say, I don't know. Well, one thing we find here is Jesus said that we know and we speak what we know. That ought to be the desire of every one of us. Jesus said, John 8, 31, 32, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we see that he spoke, 
what he knew. And there's a great example for us. Not that we can know as Jesus knew because he was God of the flesh. But we come to know things. We come to know the truth of the Bible. And we know that we know it. Somebody says you can't know it. I just go ahead and know it anyway. And then you teach what you know. And he says, Jesus did, we bear witness of that which we have seen. Well, that's all a witness can do. Isn't it? That's what a witness really is. He bears witness of what he sees. Or you could say what he hears. Well, Jesus is saying in view of who he is, John 1, 1 and 2 and 14, he's been with the Father. He knows firsthand, we might say today. And he says, I've told you marvelous things which will take place on the earth. And he says, as the son of man, I've descended out of heaven. Now that he was an antitype of the Old Testament serpent in the wilderness. That he was the one in whom there could be salvation for men. That he was, or we can say is, the gift of God's love to the world. When I say anti-type of the serpent in the wilderness, I mean he's the one that bruised the serpent's head. Way back there, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years before he had this talk with Nicodemus. After man had sinned, God makes it clear as he curses the serpent because that's the form Satan took. He made it clear that he would bruise the seed of woman's heel, but that the seed of woman would bruise his head. And a head wound is always a death wound. That's a, that's a good thought. Jesus has killed the devil. They say, well, it seems to be very much alive now. Ultimately, he knows where he's headed. It's a strange thing how that works. He is a spirit being, a very powerful being, the origin of all evil, a liar, the origin of life. He knows full well that he's headed for eternal torment, yet he wants to drag as many people down as he can. You know, you can see that in the, his servants who will not change. You remember how it was with Adolf Hitler as Germany was coming to its end and the Nazi rule about to collapse. Hitler said, well, you know, they're not worthy of me. Just burn the whole German nation down. Scorched earth policy. That was his attitude. There was nothing caring about that person. Hitler was in it for Hitler's sake from the standpoint of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And when all was lost in those areas, as it is with all men, when they come to the end of their way, they lose these things of this world. But does he show any remorse? Any, thin, any remorse from the standpoint of sorrow toward God for sinning against them that he would truly repent? No. He even takes his own life, destroys it. Now, it's interesting that men like Hitler take their lives, and multiplicity of them. They think they're escaping. But they're not escaping. They escape life in the flesh. But remember Luke 16. And the rich man who was set out by Christ as a wicked person, when he died, the scripture says he lifted up his eyes being in torment. So you escape this life by your own hand and as a very wicked person like Hitler, you step right in out of the frying pan into the fire. Fires that we can't begin to comprehend. But Jesus has ultimately inflicted the death blow to Satan. And though we're warned, that we must guard against 
Satan because he's like a roaring lion that goeth about seeking whom he may devour. We know he can't destroy us as long as we love the Lord and keep his commandments. And the Lord tells us not to fear those that can kill our body. But he tells us who to fear. Fear him who has the power to cast body and soul into hell. So the gift of God for the world, Jesus Christ, is the only one that can offer us eternal life. And that's what John's saying. Now, keep in mind, this book was written 2,000 years ago. John's writing to prove that Christ Jesus is the Son of God, is to circulate our own people with all these different ones by inspiration. John was inspired with the Holy Spirit. Pull together and say, now, when you read this, here is evidence. Somebody says, well, that's 2,000 years old. So what? How old's the sun, but it's still there. Evidence is evidence is evidence. Truth is truth is truth. I don't care whether it's a, you, you learned it now or a thousand years ago. The gospel is the same gospel today that it was in the first century. It hasn't changed. How to become a Christian hasn't changed. How to live the Christian life hasn't changed. So on and so forth. So in him, one can have eternal life. People don't think about that, but that's what John's saying. The apostle John is saying simply in giving this account of Nicodemus and Jesus' conversation with him, saying that there is no eternal life except by Jesus. That the Son of Man came into the world that men might be saved. That's his purpose. Remove that from what Jesus came to do and what's left. That's all he really came to do. We have the testimony then of the forerunner of the Christ, John the baptizer. John said he came from heaven. He is the anointed one, the Christ. He had borne witness of him. He said, uh, he's the bridegroom. He said, I am the friend of the bridegroom. But I'm not jealous of him. In fact, I rejoice in him and in his work. And he says, now and that is my joy made full. We can learn to be more like John the baptizer. He said, I must decrease and you must increase. A lot of times we can't always be at the top of the mark, we don't want to be on any mark. But John says, I'm happy to know I had this part in the whole scheme of redemption and it's unfolding. And we should have the attitude to serve where we can serve and do what we can, regardless whether we're ever noticed by men, mankind or not. He came from above and he is above all. He bears witness of that which he has seen and heard. And here's what's interesting. Even when men refuse his testimony, that doesn't change. It. Let me say that again. Take testimony for what testimony actually is. If it's genuine testimony, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe it or not. It's still testimony. He has been sent by God. Thus, he speaks the words of God. He tells us that the Father loves the Son and has given all things to his, into his hands. It's important to stop and talk about that a minute. Christ is as much human as you are or I am, but he's also as much God as God is God, for lack of a better way to put those important matters. Thus, because he's been through everything we've been through, Hipped in every point like we are yet without sin, then everything is committed to him because he knows what it's like to be where you've been. That is the thing that we all too often do not call to mind. When we face problems in life, when we're striving against sin, when we're struggling to be obedient to the truth, when we may be even rebuking ourselves 
over something we know we've done that's wrong. There's one who understands. And we sing a song sometimes, many times at funerals, Jesus knows, Jesus cares. We can help settle it in our minds a lot in the daily ups and downs of life, all through life. If we would just keep that in mind, Jesus cares for you. He's not against you. And thus the song, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Well, isn't that wonderful? But many times we don't let him bear them because we keep trying to show what great people we are and how strong human beings we are and all that. No wonder Paul said, my strength is made uh, my, uh, his strength is made perfect in weakness. And I glory in those things that are my infirmities. What does he mean? He means in those things that are characteristic of all human beings, God understands through Jesus Christ. And he's with us. And, and John's saying that. The Roman world and the Jews themselves had no concept of a thing like this. It's been around 2,000 years for us. But those people, never, this is all revolutionary to them. They have no concept of these things in, in the Roman world, the Gentile world especially. They have no idea about what we take for granted and think it's just always been here. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, the salvation brought to man thereby, was unknown before it came into the world. And we need to be thankful to God that we have it, but never take it for granted. So those who believe on the Son and who obey the Son can have eternal life. Let me say this. It's not just life unending. It means the quality of life. And John says we do not know what we shall be like in the resurrection. But we will be like him. He's talking about the quality of life that Christ now possesses, the glorified life where there's no sin no possibility of sin and nothing to cause sin no consequences of sin all that's over and done with it's gone there's no influence of it and that's what lies ahead in eternity for the child of god john wants people to know this but it's only through jesus christ that's the point of the book it's to convince people that it's only through jesus christ of nazareth that one can find these things. The wrath of God abides upon all those who refuse to obey the Son. That must be preached too. You reject the Son, where you're going to go. Remember when some, because of what they considered hard sayings, went back and walked no more with Christ. He turned to his apostles and said, Will you also go away? Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. And we know and are sure who you are. We better have that kind of knowledge and faith in Christ and his gospel that we might persevere in this world. That's what James is talking about when he talks about being faithful and what the Lord had in mind when he said, be thou faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of life. Well, in the Lord's revelation of himself to the world, he has, now in, in John's book to this point, the end of chapter three is we have it presented himself to the Jews. When you read through these first three chapters, the apostle John inspired of the spirit saying, I'm proving Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God. I start with the Jews. And now as we come to the end of this chapter, he's going to move away from the Jews. And as you go into chapter four, he's going to present him to the Samaritans. And that gets interesting. So when you are reading through, and I hope you are, reading through John, notice how he picks these people out, these evidences. And always keep in mind, these are not just little stories. He's offering this as evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. So keep those things in mind. We bring the lesson to a close at this point, and would you go with me, our Heavenly Father, in prayer. Oh, holy and righteous Father, we're thankful for this time to gather in the midst of this busy week. Thanking thee for thy word that we can study it. Praying we'll do so daily, that we'll 
engage in prayer according to thy will, that we'll entrust ourselves to thee through the gospel and be faithful to thee in all things. Give us a good night of rest. Help us to do all we can to be like Christ, that thy name might be glorified. Be with the sick and afflicted, the orphans and widows, especially these in the household of faith. And may we take our citizenship seriously and do all we can to herald forth the gospel and defend it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>